Hi, everyone. This is Doug Shadel. I'm an associate professor of musicology at Vanderbilt University's Blair School of Music uh, and chair of the Department of Musicology and Ethnomusicology. And I'm here with violist composer Nokotula Nguyenyama and multi-instrumentalist and composer Taishan Soire, whose music will be featured uh, this week by the Detroit Symphony in their ongoing uh, virtual series of concerts. And it's an incredible opportunity to be in a Zoom conversation with these two folks because they're bringing perspectives to their works as performers who also translate that work into the medium of composition. And so we're hoping to tease out a little bit of information about what it's like to sit on both sides of the stage, so to speak, as a uh, creator in the fullest sense of the word. So I'll just do a little bit of introduction of our guests. Uh, first, we have, uh, as I mentioned, Nokotula Nguyenyama, uh, who, who is essentially oozing awards as a violist, winner of the Primrose International Viola uh, Competition um, about a decade and a half ago, and has recently been the uh, president of that organization, as well as the American Viola Society. She is an Avery Fisher Grant winner. and has uh, in more recent years um, developed an outstanding career as a composer, uh, including the piece uh, that you'll hear tonight, which premiered as a viola quintet, that is a string quartet plus uh, second viola. And so uh, welcome, Nokatula. Oh, thanks so much, Doug. It's great to be here. Sure. And we also have Taishan Soire, who uh, has also had an, an uh, amazingly eclectic and successful career. Um, he is uh, academically trained with a degree from Columbia University and now sits as an assistant professor of music in the Department of Music at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, but was also a 2017 uh, MacArthur Fellowship winner, one of the so-called genius grants. Uh, yes, congratulations, and it's really an honor to be here. And these grants are intended to fund um, ultra creative projects to give people the time and space to develop uh, as artists and intellectuals. And uh, Taishan has certainly been making the most of that award, uh, including with the premiere of this violin concerto uh, that will be uh, the, one of the features of this uh, two evening concert. So welcome Taishan. It's great to be here. Thanks very much. And uh, just a couple of things that the uh, the piece for Marcos Balter, I should say, is not a violin concerto per se, but it is um, sort of a, a piece for violin and orchestra. And I tend to separate that because I kind of look at for Marcos Balter as a piece that is, I'd say, it's sort of a concerto, but without the important parts of what a concerto is, I guess you might say. So uh, just to What are the important point. parts of what a concerto <laughs> is, though? Well, usually, I mean, like typically in these, in concerti or whatever, you typically sometimes have a fast, slow, fast kind of approach in terms of movements. This uh -huh. piece is not that. Uh, this piece is in one single movement, and it's all slow. So that's the uh, piece for that. Also, you have a lot of moments of tension and release. You have a lot of things like that going on. I mean, you have things that increase in dynamics and decrease in dynamics. The whole piece is sort of a flat surface, I think, from start to finish. Um, there's points where there are motives that are sometimes in conversation with the orchestra, or there's a lot of crazy virtuosic passages and things like that, or whatever, that you will typically find in the concerto. This piece has none of that. So uh, it's a uh, it's, it's quite an adventure to listen to, and I look at it as kind of a journey along this sort of um, imaginary landscape where pretty much nothing exists, you know, and, and where everything is, you know, you sort of take everything as it is, and uh, you let the piece kind of do what it does rather than what one expects it to do when listening to it. And so this piece, I guess, one might argue is a critique of the concerto genre, but it's not, you know, it's, it's not a piece that, you know, I'm not looking to say that I disrespect the genre because so, in so fact- So you're not actively do, demonstrating something that is counter concerto for the sake of being counter concerto? 
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's not for that purpose, you know, but uh, it's, it's, it is designed in a way that I feel that's most personal to my musical language, which, you know, which is to have more or less a democratic process of performance, you know, rather than, you know, having a featured instrument, you know, versus an orchestra, like this sort of, uh, how would I say, this this conversation with the orchestra in which, you know, the uh, the soloist kind of wins or something like that. That's not what I'm looking to do here. <laughs> yeah, the kind of capital R romantic model of concerto writing is not what you're after. Yeah, no, and it's incredible. And I, I, I'm glad that I opened the can of worms by using the word concerto and then having you correct me because, you know, in a certain sense, calling a piece a concerto or a symphony is one of the most powerful framing devices uh, that composers have had over the last couple of centuries because uh, in scholarship, at least, we call that the generic contract, the genre contract that once, as you mentioned, Taishan, the, the word concerto does bring about certain expectations, including the three movement form, the relationship between the instrument and the orchestra, but then also a kind of um, the, the notion that the soloist on stage is the main focal point and that the orchestra is mere accompaniment. And I think one of the challenges of solo instrument writing has been thinking of ways to break down that barrier such that the soloist is more of a character in an ongoing narrative, or as you put it, kind of within a, a soundscape or a landscape um, that, that's more evocative rather than confrontational. And, you know, there's an, there's an interesting history of works, I think, that do that, that including the uh, viola piece Herald in Italy, which is in a certain sense the, the anti-symphony um, in that it's a symphony with a soloist. But then at the same time, it does play into a lot of tropes um, of the concerto where the violist really is the hero of the story uh, and so on. I should add that I'm also a violist, so <laughs> we may get into some viola shop talk here. And uh, I love viola, so that's this is yeah. a very good thing. <laughs> yeah, good. So we're, we're in a room among friends. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so in any case, I mean, this brings up um, a point, I think, for you too, Nokotula, which is that uh, as a composer performer, uh, I know that you've written pieces where you yourself have performed in the premiere. Um, I know in some cases as a chamber uh, ensemble artist, but have you also written for yourself as soloist? And if so, uh, how, how do you think about that process? What does it mean to write for a larger group uh, to highlight yourself? Um, well, I've, I've, I am writing a concerto of which Sonoran Storm for viola and orchestra is the last movement. So I evolved into this piece. Um, and in terms of writing a concerto, I think being a soloist is part of what I do and who I am as a performer. And so it's felt actually like a lot of fun writing a concerto that can feature uh, my playing, but also features the orchestra and the interplay between me and the orchestra. I can just create whatever I would like to have, whatever relationship I would like to have with the orchestra, I get to create. So um, I don't feel a pressure to uh, follow, I don't know, conventional guidelines. That's why I asked Taishan, like, what are those, <laughs> like, wh what are we trying to follow? The, the thing I love about composing is that you can do what you want to do. Um, so I thought, okay, it will be fun to take a concerto and, 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 and like Berlioz did with Harold in Italy, where he says in the score that the, the violist is supposed to be way down in the middle of the audience on some sort of elongated stage, which nobody performs it the way that he wanted it to because it's a joke. So, you know, I think that we have to have fun with what with our titles, so to speak. So it's a concerto. It's not traditional three movement. The first two movements are in one movement, which are roughly in an A B, like short A form, maybe. Um, so it does have material that develops, but it does maintain the. Um, the orchestra in the background when the solo is playing. And I could score that way. I, I was so sick of being covered by violins that 
I write the violins lower than the viola and I cut them out when I'm afraid that they're going to cover me. So I think that that helps. So, but I find it to be a wonderful exercise and a lot of fun. And uh, I can give homage to motifs and ideas and composers that I admire in the concerto. So it's, it's a wonderful process and I'm so excited for it to come out. It's in production, it's coming. <laughs> Yeah, terrific. I mean, that's really on my, you know, must hear list as soon as it comes out. And so many of the things that both of you are saying remind me a lot of uh, Florence Price's approach to writing concertos. Um, and before I say a little bit more about that, I, I just want to point out that this uh, season, this fall season of the Detroit Symphony uh, has been fascinating in that it is featuring so many uh, composer performers of the African diaspora earlier in the season. Uh, there is a great piece by the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, who was a virtuosic violinist, wrote many concertos, uh, very well known as a composer and a performer. And of course, Price herself was a virtuosic pianist, a virtuosic organ organist. And her piano concerto uh, is very much in the same vein, Nocatula, in the sense that um, you can tell that she's playing with the relationship between the piano and orchestra. She's writing it for herself. She performed it for herself. And some of the research that's being done on Price's piano music, especially by uh, Dr. Samantha Age in the UK, is taking it down to the level of figuring out kind of her, her hands on the piano and sort of feeling um, the, the kinesthetic dimensions of composition uh, within this concerto writing. And that of course extends to the solo piano music as well. Um, and then you also mentioned being in dialogue with other traditions with motifs and things. The first violin concerto by Price has this incredible uh, quasi quotation of Tchaikovsky's violin concerto. And it, it's funny to read um, commentary on the piece sometimes because people, um, I think, respond to quotation poorly in that they think it's imitation or lack of creativity. But I think from you know, a 20th and 21st century perspective, that sort of thing, especially from composers of the African diaspora is just part and parcel of you know, a, a well-used well aesthetic um, to be in dialogue with music of different cultures and using quotation um, as both uh, a way to honor, a way to critique, um, just a way to use and, and communicate with um, other composers and styles um, from an individual perspective. And so a lot of that is present in Price's music writ large, especially in the concertos. And so as you were talking, uh, both of you, it really reminds me a lot of Price's music, uh, which is featured on this program, uh, one of the string quartets. Now I wanna come back for a second to uh, titles. And I think that both of the pieces of yours have interesting and evocative titles. And I know that yours, Taishan, came a little bit late, at least on the website for a while, it was untitled. And then it suddenly appeared for Marcos Balter. Um, could you say a little bit about um, how you arrived at that title? Um, Marcos, of course, is a, is a well-known composer and you know, a social justice advocate um, and, and uh, a very kind of well-liked uh, well member of the new music community. Uh, could you say a little bit more about that dimension of the piece and maybe how it plays out in your conception of it? Well, for all of the reasons that you stated, uh, Marcos is a very important individual for me. Um, but moreover, it's, it's on par with my titling system in general. I don't like giving titles to um, my titles per se to any of my pieces because that's not really the relationship that I feel that I have uh, with my music. So an alternate way around that would be for me to title something um, after someone who is important to me in my life or people who are, you know, have been very influential to me in terms of my overall development as a composer or as a performer even. So a lot of my titles would have four and then the name of a artist or a musician who has inspired me uh, from a certain time in my life, even the present. Uh, and Marcos is one of them. Um, he is one of the musicians who I felt um, really gave me the encouragement. I mean, he's a dear friend and colleague of mine, but he's given me encouragement, you know, through the years that I've known him 
um, in the new music community as to, you know, represent my own voice without compromise. And um, that's always been Marcos's ethos in terms of what he has presented in his own work. I'm thinking of a work that he wrote for uh, soprano saxophone, for example, called Wicker Park, uh, which is an amazing uh, solo saxophone piece. And it blew me away when I first heard it. I mean, this was years ago, but it, it really blew me away when I first uh, listened to that piece of music. And it made me feel so much like I imagined myself playing because I'm a pianist also. So it kind of made me imagine myself sort of playing that music on a piano, just solo. And to listen to the saxophone player who played that piece just represented a certain kind of vulnerability that I feel is missing um, in a lot of music that I hear today. And Marcos' music really sort of is so visceral in that way. And it really speaks to, um, it, 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 it just speaks to the value that he puts, you know, into his performers, whoever plays his music. And also the, uh, just how personal his voice is. And so for me, Marcos, um, is heavily influential in that regard. And uh, so, yeah, that's why I, I titled the piece after him. And also, I should say, going back to the model of the concerto, since we're talking about questioning what that model is, uh, to, it's, it's funny, to coin a phrase, I call it a non-certo. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> and... That's yeah, funny. and 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 yeah, it, it's it's funny, you know, for all of the reasons that I stated earlier, when uh, talking about this piece, I I also think in this piece there's sort of a lack of motif or lack of motives. It's rather an evolutionary process, I think, just in terms of how the piece goes. I mean, it, it goes from start to finish, and it's only concerned about the movement of sound, you know, throughout the small orchestra, the orchestra sizes is fairly small and I wanted it that way just so I can find a way to somehow get sounds and sonorities moving throughout the room, but also allow for there to sometimes be two sounds, <laughs> only two sounds that coexist at once. So, and again, when you listen to the uh, violin part, Jenny Coe, who is a fabulous uh, soloist and, uh, champion of new music um and when you hear her musician. perform the piece that's right ex absolutely uh jenny you know she has to sit within the orchestra there's no standing in front of the orchestra so that's the other part of the model that's challenging and also uh what's also challenging is that there's no melodic segment that necessarily sticks out anywhere in this piece there may be occasional moments where you will only hear the violin but at no point is there sort of this sort of duel or whatever between the orchestra and the soloist. Um, I'd also like to add that sometimes, or a lot of the time, Jenny is also, you know, even though her voice would stand out in front of the orchestra a little more, um, some of the sounds that she produces are an equal part of whatever sonority or harmony is present uh, during the performance of the piece. So you almost have sort of like, and that's why I said imaginary landscape, because you're sort of, you, you sort of have like this sort of imaginary soloist. You're wondering, well, where is the soloist? Well, the soloist is there, but you have to use your imagination to travel to where that sound or where Jenny's sounds are coming from. And because the sound is like just close to equal in terms of the way that, you know, she is positioned along with the orchestra, I think it's fascinating to sort of imagine this, uh, imagine Jenny as a soloist, but then you're not hearing that soloist, but then when your ear travels to her as the soloist, there you have her, you know. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really struck by two, th I mean, many things, but at least two things um, that, that, uh, that strike me immediately. One is um, this latter point that you're making, uh, because earlier you said something about music and its relationship to democracy and making a democratic type of music. And it really seems like you're manifesting that. And it's, it's incredible because earlier uh, before the call started, Nokotula and I were talking about um, 
music's potential to be a metaphor for society uh, and does society live up to the metaphors that music gives it um, and in many cases the answer is simply no uh, but that shouldn't stop creators from reimagining society through the lens of music and I think that listeners um, you know coming at it through that lens will really get a lot and then the musicologist in me, the second thing is, um, you know, how important individuals are in the creative lives of musicians and this notion of naming a piece after an individual, I find really touching. And of course, um, you know, Jenny Ko has a lot of experience working directly with composers as an advocate for new music. And I find um, not only is her playing outstanding, but she articulates this relationship between performers and composers very well. And I, I have a feeling that, you know, in 50, 100 years, people will look back on these collaborative relationships that have happened uh, in new music during the early 2000s and really see the networks of individuals who have had a profound effect on each other um, personally, creatively, and so on, rather than thinking about the isolated artist, uh, the artist genius, uh, that's, that really comes about in the 19th century, sort of like we were saying with the virtuoso um, hero uh, in the concerto. I think that the way music is, is um, constructed within an ecosystem now is, is just quite a bit different um, than it's been in the sort of classical music past um, to, to paint a very broad brush. Now thinking about your piece too, Nokatula, Primal Message, um, I noticed that uh, you mentioned in a uh, commentary about it. Let me pull this up very quickly. Um, you're quoted as saying that it's based on the idea of communicating the things we learn to communicate with each other, our intelligence, our emotions, our goodness. And it, to me, those words, intelligence, emotion, goodness, are about the fundamentals of human existence. And that may be this notion of primal. And so could you say a little bit more about um, how this piece is meant to communicate with the audience, the musicians communicating with each other on stage and kind of what the main takeaway is. Um, and and before, you, before you hit the go button, I just want to add that this piece for me has an incredible emotional trajectory and there are moments of density and profound um, kind of uh, not, not cerebral. I mean, the music in a sense feels cerebral, but the emotion really comes through. And so I'm getting a sense of all of those things, emotions, intelligence, goodness, and many other things, sometimes all at once. And then there are moments of uh, quiet and solitude uh, when soloists are playing. And so tell us a bit more about this idea of a primal message and what you hope the piece uh, is communicating uh, on stage and to the audience. Well, thank you, Doug. Um... Well, I, I would like to invite the audience to just come on a journey with this supposed, well, it's this Arecibo message that is floating through space to M13 globular cluster. So um, if, if the audience can open up their imaginations to imagine the journey of this message, I think we're off to a great start. Uh, there is a section where it's written flow through space. So the orchestra, I actually hope that they levitate and start flying away when they play that part. It's all about the emotion or the feeling of the um, imagined journey of this message. Um, I think primal message in and of itself, there's a lot of usage of prime numbers. So two, three, five, seven composers. Well, I like to use them because it's just some sort of framework um for ideas and what do i want to go against what do i you know against itself against something else um leaps um just the decisions that we make to convey the the sentiment that that we're feeling i think so i wanted to uh, explore that relationship um i also wanted to explore the idea that we as human beings already are leading with the faith, if you will, that one other life out there can understand how we communicate. 
I think we have this feeling that whatever life may exist off of this planet must be like us. And who are we to assume that life is like us? So we live out this anthropomorphic dream of communicating beyond. And then if that life is indeed like us, do we assume that it's going to be nice and kind? Or if it's like us, might there also be a, a threat of some sort? So uh, Stephen Johnson's um, article in New York Times Magazine called Greetings ET, Please Don't Murder Us, basically started this entire journey of trying to figure out what a primal message from us collectively could be. So that's the journey that I would like the audience and the orchestra to, to come on during the world premiere. Yeah, well, and I mean, this, it's really a grand, a grand design. I mean, this notion of conveying what humanity is, um, is you know, really one of the, the most complete, comprehensive uh, notions that one could come up with. And as you were talking, I was realizing that er earlier today, in fact, I saw a, a headline story about how uh, space scientists had recently discovered perhaps the most habitable um, extra planet or whatever the term is for a planet outside of our solar system that may have the conditions necessary for human life. And as you were talking, I was thinking even that notion of habitability of another planet presumes that our notion of life is the only one. And so, um, you know, how you see what I'm saying about the, the anthropocentrism or whatever it is that you're mentioning and that, yes. that um, you know, what, even what we're looking for out there is us, um, rather than sort of accepting it as it is in a certain sense. Um, yeah, no, so this is incredible. I mean, I love that um, these, both of these pieces are uh, deeply personal and yet also taking on the biggest questions about politics and humanity uh, and life. And, you know, I would just add that even the Florence Price piece called Five Folk Songs in Counterpoint is addressing a similar question, which is what does it mean to be American? And what is the, uh, the social fabric of American culture, which is certainly a question that I think we're facing um, with, with great urgency now, um, perhaps with greater urgency than we've seen in a long time, perhaps even in our, our lifetimes, all being uh, younger folks. And I wanna just read quickly a quotation um, from Florence Price that she wrote in a school essay in a, during her continuing education period. This is, she's an old, uh, kind of a middle-aged adult, I guess she's in her, uh, mid forties here. So she, anyway, she's not a college student, but what she says is within the last dozen years, America has become music conscious. No longer is it necessary for an American musician to assume a foreign name as a passport of approval. It is now the other way around. No longer um, must one hie to foreign shores for study in order to achieve prestige. No longer are we ashamed of our own musical composers. More and more conductors are including upon their programs the works of contemporary Americans. And then she says, we are even beginning to believe in the possibility of establishing a national musical idiom. We are waking up to the fact, pregnant with possibilities, that we already emphasized, underlined, already have a folk music in the Negro spirituals. Uh, music which is potent, poignant, compelling. It is simple heart music and therefore powerful. It runs the gamut of emotions uh, spontaneously. And what I take away from this is that uh, like many composers of her generation and sort of surrounding half generations, she's really thinking about how is it that we construct this image of America, this complicated multiracial, multi-ethnic image of America. And one way that she does it is through this piece. And this is a challenging piece it's sort of deceptively challenging that there are five short movements, each of which is a uh, contrapuntal or polyphonic rumination on an American folk song, some of which come from Black American traditions and, of course, uh, the African diaspora from there, and some of which are more affiliated with uh, white heritage. Um, 
but all sort of folk music in the sense that they seem to be uh, authorless and timeless. And what I think is fascinating, especially with a connection to Taishan's piece, is that she's really, um, well, and yours too, Nokatula, in the sense that you were talking about prime numbers and this, just this notion of manipulating the musical material according to some very composerly um, and, and kind of crafts, craftsmanship, uh, very uh, intent on uh, conveying uh, her craft in this piece while at the same time trying to convey some of the most fundamental questions about our social existence. And so this, this entire concert piece uh, over the two days, I think will really make for a fascinating and rewarding journey into the human condition uh, through the lens of an extraordinary variety of composers. And I realize that we may be giving a little bit of short shrift to Dvorak, but I don't know, maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this. I think his piece is far and away the least interesting <laughs> despite being the most well-known and sort of, uh, it's a very charming piece. This is a serenade for strings that he wrote in about 1875. So it's well before uh, he was engaged with music of the African diaspora in the 1890s, which of course then went on to influence Price a bit. Uh, but in any case, um, this is about our time and I'll just, leave by asking you all, is there anything else that you haven't been able to say uh, that you'd like to say to the folks watching? Um, and we'll start with you, Nokatula. Oh, um, well, I hope that uh, they all enjoy these works that are being featured over the two days and that I hope everyone also stays safe. Yeah, terrific, thank you. And Taishan? Um, similarly, um, all of what Nokatula has just said, and in addition to that, um, expect nothing. Let the music wash over you like you do any other music you listen to. And I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, I think, I think this notion of coming as you are to the music and experiencing it as it is so that there is a reciprocal acceptance is really a fulfilling way of approaching uh, music that's new for you, but especially music that's appearing as a world premiere that no one has heard and just allowing it to, to speak and enter you is such a wonderful experience. And I just wanna close by saying thanks to both of you for the opportunity to have this conversation. It was very rewarding for me and I, I could, as, as a musicology nerd, I could totally go on for another three hours, if not even more. Um, but I I'm almost feel like we should. <laughs> it's been such yeah, yeah. a wonderful conversation. I've enjoyed every moment. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, and, and yeah, in a certain sense, I feel like we're just getting started. So um, I hope I hope we'll have a chance again. And uh, for all the Detroit Symphony audience members, I hope you enjoy. So thank you very much.